In this video, I'll introduce some landmark court decisions related to school desegregation. The Dred Scott v. Sanford case and the Plessy v. Ferguson case are not directly about education, but the cases provide a historical background of school desegregation. In the Brown v. Board of Education case, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled unanimously that racial segregation of children in public schools were unconstitutional. The McPherson case is not whether the school should be desegregated, but rather how best to do it. The last case of Cruz Guzman v. State of Minnesota is a class action lawsuit filed in 2015, and the case was settled in April 2021. Before the Civil War, a slave named Dred Scott was taken by his slave owners from Missouri, which was a slaveholding state, into Illinois and the Wisconsin Territory, which were free areas where slavery was illegal. When his owners later brought him back to Missouri, Scott sued in court for his freedom and claimed that because he had been taken into free U.S. territory, he had automatically been freed and was legally no longer a slave. Scott sued first in Missouri State Court, which ruled that he was still a slave under its law. He then sued in the U.S. Federal Court, which ruled against him by deciding that it had to apply Missouri law to the case. He then appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. Scott was represented by Montgomery Blair, who was a lawyer from Maryland. He later served in Lincoln administration cabinet as postmaster general from 1861 to 1864 during the Civil War. What you see on the screen is the painting of the first reading of the Emancipation Proclamation by President Lincoln. The setting of the painting is in Lincoln's office. It is now known as the Lincoln Bedroom. Lincoln told the painter each cabinet member's position in the room on the day of the first reading of the Emancipation Proclamation. There was Montgomery Blair, U.S. Postmaster General. Blair had already achieved national fame when he represented the slave Dred Scott before the U.S. Supreme Court. The Supreme Court issued a 7-2 decision against Dred Scott. Chief Justice Roger Taney was a supporter of the South and slavery. In the majority opinion written by Taney, the court wrote that black people are not included and were not intended to be included under the word citizen in the Constitution and can therefore claim none of the rights and privileges which that instrument provides for and secures to citizens of the United States. Teddy supported his ruling with an extended survey of American state and local laws from the time of the Constitution's drafting in 1787 that purported to show that a perpetual and impassable barrier was intended to be erected between the white race and the one which they had reduced to slavery. Because the court wrote that Scott was not an American citizen, he was not a citizen of any state. After ruling on those issues surrounding Scott, Taney continued further and struck down the entire Missouri Compromise as a limitation on slavery that exceeded the U.S. Congress constitutional powers. Taney wrote, it is the opinion of the court that the act of Congress, which prohibited a citizen from holding and owning property of this kind in the territory of the United States north of the 3630 latitude line therein mentioned, is not warranted by the Constitution and is therefore void. Here is some background of the Missouri Compromise. In 1803, the United States acquired the vast territory from France through the Louisiana Purchase. In the late 1810s, a major political dispute arose over the creation of new American states 
from the newly acquired territory. The dispute centered on whether the new states would be free states like the existing northern states in which slavery would be illegal, or whether they would be slave states like the existing southern states in which slavery would be legal. The southern states wanted the new states to be slave states in order to enhance their own political and economic power. The northern states wanted the new states to be free states for their own political and economic reasons, as well as the moral concerns over allowing the institution of slavery to expand. In 1820, the U.S. Congress passed an agreement known as the Missouri Compromise that was intended to resolve the dispute. The compromise first admitted Maine into the Union as a free state, then created Missouri out of a portion of the Louisiana Purchase territory and admitted it as a slave state. But at the same time, prohibited slavery in the area north of the parallel 36-30 North, where most of the territory lay. The legal effect of a slave owner taking his slaves from Missouri into the free territory north of 36-30 North parallel, as well as the constitutionality of the Missouri Compromise itself. Eventually, came to a head in the Dred Scott case. In 1865, after the Union won the Civil War, the Dred Scott ruling was voided by the Thirteenth Amendment to the U.S. Constitution, which abolished slavery, and the Fourteenth Amendment, which guaranteed citizenship for all persons born or naturalized in the United States and subject to the jurisdiction thereof. Before the Civil War, a slave named Dred Scott was taken by his slave owners from Missouri, which was a slaveholding state, into Illinois and the Wisconsin Territory, which were free areas where slavery was illegal. When his owners later brought him back to Missouri, Scott sued in court for his freedom. And claimed that because he had been taken into free U.S. territory, he had automatically been freed and was legally no longer a slave. Scott sued first in Missouri State Court, which ruled that he was still a slave under its law. He then sued in the U.S. federal court, which ruled against him by deciding that it had to apply Missouri law to the case. He then appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. Many historians considered the Dred Scott v. Sanford decision was the U.S. Supreme Court's worst decision. Taney and some of the other justices hoped that the Supreme Court decision would permanently settle the slavery controversy, which was increasingly dividing the American public. But the decision's effect was the complete opposite. The decision inflamed the national debate over slavery, strengthened Northern opposition to slavery. It also encouraged Southern supporters of slavery to make bolder demands. The Dred Scott v. Sanford decision deepened the divide that led ultimately to the Civil War. Let's now look at Plessy v. Ferguson case. In this case, the U.S. Supreme Court upheld the constitutionality of racial segregation laws for public facilities as long as the segregated facilities were equal in quality. This principle came to be known as separate but equal. The decision legitimized many state laws that re-established racial segregation after the Reconstruction era. Homer Plessy was a man of mixed race. He had seven eighths white and one eighth African American ancestry. Due to his appearance as white, Plessy could have ridden in a railroad car restricted to people classified as white. However, under the racial policies of the time, he was considered black. Hoping to strike down segregation laws, 
the Citizens Committee persuaded Plessy to deliberately violate Louisiana's Separate Car Act of 1890, which required equal but separate railroad accommodations for white and non-white passengers. To pose a clear test, the Citizens Committee gave notice of Plessy's intent to the railroad company, which opposed the law because it required adding more cars to its trains. In 1892, Plessy bought a first-class ticket on a train and sat in the car for white riders only. The committee had hired a private detective. With arrest powers to take Plessy off the train to ensure that he was charged with violating the state's separate car law and not some other misdemeanor, Plessy pleaded not guilty, contending that the law was unconstitutional. He lost the trial, and the conviction was sustained by the Louisiana Supreme Court. Plessy then appealed to the U.S. Supreme Court. In 1896, the Supreme Court issued a seven-to-one decision against Plessy, ruling that the Louisiana law did not violate the Fourteenth Amendment. Justice Henry Billings Brown wrote in the opinion of the court: "The object of the Fourteenth Amendment was undoubtedly to enforce the absolute equality of the two races before the law, but in the nature of things, it could not have been intended to abolish distinctions based upon color." Or to enforce social as distinguished from political equality, or a commingling of the two races upon terms unsatisfactory to either. Justice John Marshall Harlan dissented. He wrote, "But in the views of the Constitution, in the eye of the law, there is in this country no superior." Dominant ruling class of citizens. There is no caste here. Our constitution is color blind and neither knows nor tolerates classes among citizens. In respect of civil rights, all citizens are equal before the law. The humblest is the peer of the most powerful. The law regards men as men and takes no account of his surroundings or of his color when his civil rights, as guaranteed by the Supreme Court of the land, are involved. In my opinion, the judgment of this day, rendered well in time, proved to be quite as pernicious as the decision made by this tribunal in the Dred Scott case. Brown v. Board of Education was a landmark 1954 Supreme Court case in which the justices ruled unanimously that racial segregation of children in public schools was unconstitutional. Plessy v. Ferguson was never explicitly overruled by the Supreme Court, but with the Brown v. Board of Education decision, the Plessy decision is effectively dead. A student named Linda Brown was denied entrance to all white elementary schools. Her parents filed a class action suit against the school board. The parents claimed that schools for black children were not equal to the white schools, and that segregation violated the so-called equal protection clause of the Fourteenth Amendment, which holds that no state can deny any person within its jurisdiction the equal protection of the laws. When Brown's case and four other cases related to school segregation first came before the Supreme Court in 1952, the court combined them into a single case under the name Brown v. Board of Education. This case was one of the cornerstones of civil rights movement. And helped establish the precedent that separate but equal education and other services were not equal at all. Thurgood Marshall, the head of the NAACP Legal Defense and Educational Fund, served as the chief attorney for the student. 
Thirteen years later, in 1967, he was appointed by President Lyndon Johnson as the first Black Supreme Court justice. At first, the justices were divided on how to rule on school segregation, with Chief Justice Fred Vinson holding the opinion that the Plessy verdict should stand. But Vinson died. In September 1953, before Brown v. Board of Education was to be heard, President Dwight Eisenhower replaced him with Earl Warren, then Governor of California. In the court decision, Warren wrote, "In the field of public education, the doctrine of separate but equal has no place, as segregated schools are inherently unequal. As a result." The court ruled that the black students were being deprived of equal protection of the laws guaranteed by the Fourteenth Amendment. In its verdict, the U.S. Supreme Court did not specify how exactly schools should be integrated, but asked for further argument about it. In May 1955, the court issued a second opinion in the case. Known as Brown v. Board of Education II, which remanded further desegregation cases to lower federal courts and directed the district courts and school boards to proceed with desegregation with all deliberate speed. Though well intentioned, the court's actions effectively opened the door for local judicial and political evasion of desegregation. While Kansas and some other states acted in accordance with the verdict, many school and local officials in the South defied it. In one major example, Governor of Arkansas called out the state National Guard to prevent black students from attending high school in Little Rock in 1957. After a tense standoff, President Eisenhower deployed federal troops, and nine students, known as the Little Rock Nine, were able to enter Central High School under armed guard. The Supreme Court's decision in Brown v. Board of Education and the resistance to it fueled the civil rights movement in the United States. In 1955, a year after the Brown v. Board of Education decision, Rosa Parks refused to give up her seat on the Montgomery, Alabama bus. Her arrest sparked the Montgomery bus boycott, which would lead to other boycotts, sit-ins, and demonstrations in the movement that would eventually lead to the toppling of Jim Crow laws across the South. The fourth case we look at here is the McPherson case. This case is not whether the schools should be desegregated, but whether how best to do it. Springfield is the capital city of the state of Illinois. President Abraham Lincoln lived here from 1837 to 1861, and then moved to the White House as the President of the United States. In 1974, the city's population was about 92,000, with 19,000 students in its schools. Of this, 17.2 were minority children. Most of the minorities are blacks who live in the center of the city. The minority children attended elementary schools in their neighborhoods, and those schools had predominantly black enrollment. In 1974, student parents filed a class action charging the school board and their predecessors with numerous deliberate actions, all of which boil down to creating, fostering, and maintaining racial and ethnic segregation in the Springfield public schools. In 1975, the school board submitted a document entitled. Plan for racial integration, but the plan was rejected by the judge because the plan did not meet minimum constitutional requirements or comply with the provisions of the consent decree. 
In 1976, the school board submitted a second plan entitled "An Overall Desegregation Plan for the Springfield Public Schools." The parents filed an objections to the school board's plan and filed a plan of their own. At a pre-trial conference, both parties agreed to the desegregation plan for middle schools, and that part of the plan was ordered to be implemented in the fall of 1976. The parents disagreed with the rest of the desegregation plan, so they filed a second plan. The school board wanted to postpone any consideration of the parents' second plan until the court rejected the school board's second plan. The school board asserted that the court had no power to view the parents' plan until it was established that the school board's plan was either unconstitutional or unacceptable. The court held that. Once a right and a violation have been shown, the scope of a district court's equitable powers to remedy past wrongs is broad. Another issue discussed in this case was the proper use of percentages and ratios. The school board asserted that the proper standard for determining whether a school is racially identifiable is plus or minus 15 percent from the average minority student enrollment for the district. Therefore, any school in the district having a minority enrollment of more than 2.2 percent and less than 32.2 percent would not be racially identifiable. The parents, on the other hand, asserted that a variance of plus or minus 10 percent from the percentage of minority enrollment is the appropriate range of non-racially identifiable schools. Therefore, under the parents' standards, a school having a minority enrollment of more than 8.7 percent but less than 28.7 percent would not be racially identifiable. The court noted that there is no substantive constitutional right to a particular degree of racial balancing or mixing. The use of such ratios and percentages is a permissible starting point in the process of shaping a remedy. Here, both of the proposed standards would be used as tools to fashion the appropriate remedy. But neither shall receive the court's stamp of approval or be regarded as absolute and unyielding to other factors. After comparing and discussing the desegregation plans proposed by both the parents and the school board, the court concluded that the parents' plan for the K-16 levels would be implemented. The school board's plan for the middle school would be continued, and the school board's plan at the high school level would be adopted and continued, incorporating the school board's plan for yearly re-examination and boundary changes as necessary. Moreover, the school board was ordered by the court to implement six changes, including student transportation, faculty and staff transfers. And establishing a citizen monitoring committee. In 2015, a class action lawsuit was filed by a parent in Minnesota. The parent charged that segregated schools, enabled by state enrollment laws, are preventing students of colors from getting an adequate education in the Twin Cities area. The public schools in Minnesota and St. Paul have been disproportionately comprised of students of color and students living in poverty, as compared with a number of neighboring and surrounding schools and districts. Those segregated and hypersegregated schools have significantly worse academic outcomes in comparison with neighboring schools and suburban school districts in many measures, such as graduation rates, pass rates for the state basic standards test, and proficiency rates in math, science, and reading. The student parent described those racially and socially economically segregated schools as separate, 
but unequal from neighboring and surrounding whiter and more affluent suburban schools. The student parent also highlighted several practices by the Minnesota and Saint Paul public schools, other school districts, charter schools, and the state as contributing to school segregation and inadequate educational outcomes. The practices include boundary decisions for school districts and school attendance areas. The formation of segregated charter schools and the decision to exempt charter schools from desegregation plans, the use of federal and state desegregation funds for other purposes, and the failure to implement effective desegregation remedies, and the inequitable allocation of resources. In April 2021. Minnesota officials agreed to create a metro-wide student busing program, establish new magnet schools, and order racially isolated charter and district schools to integrate. In this video, I'll introduce some landmark court decisions related to school desegregation. The Dred Scott v. Sanford case and the Plessy v. Ferguson case are not directly about education, but the cases provide a historical background of school desegregation. In the Brown v. Board of Education case, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled unanimously that racial segregation of children in public schools were unconstitutional. The McPherson case is not whether the school should be desegregated, but rather how best to do it. The last case of Cruz Guzman versus the State of Minnesota is a class action lawsuit filed in 2015, and the case was settled in April 2021. In this video, I introduced some landmark court decisions related to school desegregation. I started with the Dred Scott v. Sanford case and the Plessy v. Ferguson case. These two cases are not directly about education, but they provide a historical background of school desegregation. I then introduce the Brown v. Board of Education case, in which the U.S. Supreme Court ruled unanimously that racial segregation of children in public schools was unconstitutional. The McPherson case is not whether the schools should be desegregated, but rather how to do it. The last case of Cruz Guzman v. State of Minnesota is a class action lawsuit filed in 2015, and the case was settled in April 2021.